the younger brother of the much better known Nicephorus II Phocas, who of course ascended to the throne, Leo Phocas tends to be an overlooked and forgotten man in the annals of 10th century Byzantine history. Yet, despite often being overlooked, I think that there's a very strong case to be made that Leo Phocas is in fact the most talented general of his generation, that being the time after John Kirkawas and before Basil II, the Bulgar Slayer. In this video, I will lay out Leo's accomplishments and his career, and I will also show how he was a key asset to his brother and how his contributions were absolutely vital for Nicephorus succeeding in Crete and then going on to be emperor. By the time that Leo Phocas the Younger was born, around 915 to 920, his family had already established itself as the most prominent member of the military aristocracy. His grandfather, Nicephorus Phocas the Elder, was the most prominent man of his generation. He had been a highly successful general under Leo VI, managing to win battles in southern Italy against the advancing and highly successful Arabs who had conquered Sicily, and then he was employed in the Balkans where he faced off against the Bulgarians who were also on the rise. Leo's uncle and namesake, Leo Phocas the Elder, inherited much of the position of his father Nicephorus the Elder, but almost none of his talent. Leo was, Leo the Elder, I mean, was a poor general, and he was entrusted with fighting Simeon during the childhood of Constantine the Seventh. He and Romanus I Lycopinus were rivals for the hand of Zoe Carbonopsina and guardianship over young Constantine the Seventh. Of course, Romanus I was able to win, largely because he was a better general, but also he was a much more talented politician and a more cunning opportunist. Uh, Leo Phocas the Elder had a younger brother named Bardas, who was the father of Leo the Younger and the future emperor Nicephorus the Younger. Bardas was born around 878, and while he no doubt enjoyed some high rank under during the time of his brother Leo, Bardas would only really rise to prominence with Constantine the Seventh when he eventually came to power in his own right as an adult in 945. Leo the Younger's older brother, Nicephorus, was born around 912. Leo himself was born maybe around 915 or as late as 920. It's clear that he had to be younger simply because he was not given the overall command when Bardas retired, despite the fact that he had more actual accomplishments under his belt than his brother Nicephorus. The two brothers, Phocas, also had a nephew who was not much younger than they were, named John Zemiskis. He was born around 925, and since all of them were pretty close in age, they would be associates for most of their adult lives, and their success together would be something that would really advance Byzantine interest in the East, and also, as we'll see, lead to a great deal of family drama. During the long reign of Romanus I, the Phocas family would be largely on the sidelines. Sure, Bardos would continue to serve as a strategos of a theme, and he would control a lot of things, but he was not nearly as prominent as his father or brother had been, simply because his faction was out of favor with the current emperor. Romanus did enough to keep Bardos happy, but not enough to really win him over or fully utilize him. It should come as no surprise that in 945, Bardas backed Constantine the Seventh against the sons of Romanus the First, and when Constantine won, he was duly grateful to the Phocas family, which had tried to save him from the tyranny of Romanus all those years before. It's speculated by some scholars that Bardas and Constantine had had a correspondence well before 945, but given how dangerous that would have been for Bardas especially, I kind of doubt it. I imagine it was more an understood thing where they recognized each other as allies because they had a common foe. After all, Romanus I, due to his actions, had led to the death of Leo, and I imagine that Bardas was not super thrilled with having his brother killed. At any rate, Constantine's way to repay Bardas's loyalty was to name him as Domesticus of the East, replacing the famous general John Kirkawas. 
Bardos would then be able to place his two sons and his nephew in high places of power and effectively create an east that was completely controlled by the Focades. The younger Leo would become Stratagos of Cappadocia, with Nicephorus and John Zemiskis taking up similar posts, also serving as Stratagoi of their own themes. At this time, in 945, Leo the Younger would have been about 30 years old, so he was old enough to have had some experience, and but still young enough to have the energy to really try to make a name for himself and go out and get things done. Leo also seems to have been a devoted student of war, and he was especially interested in reading everything that he could on skirmishing tactics and harassing larger forces with smaller forces. A lot of the frontier warfare of this era was based on large-scale raids and counter-raids, so this pr would prove to be a wise preparation for Leo as his career advanced, since he would find himself in this exact situation on many occasions. For the next nine to ten years, Leo would serve under his father Bardos as a subordinate general. Bardos would serve as Domesticus of the East from 945 until his retirement in 954 to 955. One of the things that Bardos is known for is being an old man when his son is competing for the throne, so I suppose that you could say that one of Bardos' character traits is that he is old. When he retired from military service, he was 77 years old, give or take, and just to give you an idea of how active he was, just the year before that he had been involved in a battle and he had been severely wounded, barely recovering from that wound. So while Bardos was old, he was an active commander, and he appears to have put in his uh, full effort into all of these campaigns despite his advanced age. However, despite Bardos' best efforts, he simply was not on the same level as his predecessor, John Kirkawas. He was not able to compete with the Emir of Aleppo, Saif al Dalla who was a wily and successful ruler who launched many raids and won a good number of mostly small victories against Byzantine forces on Bardas' watch. However, in spite of the overarching pattern of the Focades being bested by Saif on a consistent basis, Leo was the one member of that family who did manage to distinguish himself during this somewhat dark period for the family. By 950, Saif was on quite a roll, and he had embarrassed the Focades on a number of occasions. He confidently raided the theme of Charcianon, presumably not expecting to be harassed or seriously challenged by the Byzantines. He then tried to retreat, laden with plunder. Rather than taking on Saif head-on, Saif seems to have had a numerical advantage, Leo instead circled around the Emir of Aleppo and set up an ambush probably in a mountain pass or some other narrow area where he thought that Saif would pass through on his way back to Aleppo. Saif, like I said, was overconfident. He was laden down with plunder, and he was not on his guard. He marched without any hesitation into this big ambush that Leo laid out for him, and this resulted in a great victory for the Byzantines. Saif was forced to flee. He was able to flee with a lot of his bodyguard troops, but the majority of his army was either cut down or captured. This Byzantine victory came literally out of nowhere in the midst of mostly defeats, and it was stunning enough that the previously bellicose Muslims of Cilicia who had been profiting from this war urged Saif to sue for peace, lest they then be invaded now that Saif's army was no longer able to march to their defense. Bardos' retirement turned out to be a great benefit for the fortunes of the Focades. After Bardos retired, Leo's older brother Nicephorus took overall command in the east as Domesticus, and we would see that he would pursue Saif with a much better strategy. By 956, Nicephorus was coordinating the efforts of the generals of the east and making sure that even if they had to receive some of Saif's attacks, they were also mounting their own operations in order to spread him thin and wear him down. Saif simply did not have the kind of resources that the Byzantines had at their disposal. That year in 956, the Byzantines were active against Saif on four separate fronts. 
Leo was the one general entrusted with the largest offensive responsibilities as he led an army to the city of Maras on the Euphrates River. The other generals were mostly on the defensive, including Nicephorus himself, and there was also an admiral named Basil Hexamilites who challenged the fleet of Tarsus. So Tarsus technically was not part of Sayut's realm, so that front actually did not involve him. It's actually three fronts that they were fighting Saif on, and then one for Saif's main ally. Basil Hexamilites was able to win a smashing naval victory against Tarsus that year, and while Leo did not take Maras, so far as I know, he did manage to capture one of Saif's cousins during his campaign, and the combination of these two things gave Constantine a reason to celebrate, and then a prominent captive to parade. So Constantine VII was able to claim a triumph largely because of the deeds of Leo Phocas. For the next two or three years, the Byzantine forces under Nicephorus's overall direction continued to make progress in Cilicia and to whittle down the strength of Saif al-Dawla. However, when Romanus II came to the throne in 959, his number one priority was mounting a major expedition against Crete to reduce the emirate there, restore that island to Byzantine control, and thereby free all of the inland Byzantine coast from piracy and raiding. He therefore stripped away a lot of the field units from both the east and west and put them under the command of Nicephorus, who was to command the expedition. This meant that the generals who were left behind, including Leo, would be forced to face potential invasions with mostly second-rate troops, and not as many of them as one would ideally want. Leo did manage to strike one final blow before his brother's expedition by launching what seems to have been a small-scale invasion of Cilicia in late 959 or very early 960, feigning at the city of Tarsus and then striking at the Dair Bakir area. Saif arrived to challenge Leo, and in the ensuing battle, Leo was able to defeat him and capture yet more of Saif's relatives. This seems to have been a somewhat embarrassing but not terribly damaging victory. And presumably, this impressed Romanus II enough that he thought that Saif wouldn't dare show his face for the next couple of years, and that he could reappoint Leo, his most talented general outside of Nicephorus, to the west, where he thought the Magyars might be stirring. Zemiskis was left in the east to take command there. He was now quite experienced, even if he was still on the young side. And this left Nicephorus to lead a massive Cretan expedition. So, of all three major armies in the empire, three of them were under members of the same family. Marianos Arguros was fresh off of his command in Italy at this time, so whoever had taken his place would not have been a big name. And now we reach the year 960, which I think is very clearly the year in which Leo Phocas most clearly demonstrated his talents. That year, Nicephorus would capture all the headlines, both at the time and later, with his conquest of Crete, which was truly one of the major turning points in 10th century Byzantine history. However, while Nicephorus captured the headlines, I think that one can argue that what Leo accomplished with far fewer men was far more brilliant and impressive. To quote Anthony Caldellus, who wrote a 2017 book covering the 10th century, Imperial defenses in both the West and East consisted now of whatever Leon Phocas could improvise. As we'll see, despite being appointed to the West, he would be active all over the place during this year. It seems that all of Byzantium's enemies decided to take advantage of the absence of the field units and try to get a little plunder. In early 960, shortly after Leo's arrival, the Magyars launched a large raid to take advantage of the weakened army of the Balkans, but Leo managed to defeat these raiders, probably due to his mastery of harassment and ambush tactics. This defeat seems to have been convincing enough in the eyes of the Emperor Romanus II, but clearly was not crippling since um, if you've seen my video on Marianus Arguros, you already know that the Magyars returned shortly after that and had to be defeated again. However, the second defeat would not come at the hands of Leo. 
News arrived from the east that Saif had unexpectedly launched another major offensive in the area, and so Leo was rerouted to the east to take command of the forces there and try to contain and defeat Saif's invasion. Given Leo's established mastery of small unit tactics, one could reasonably expect him to hold on to all of Byzantium cities and force Saif to withdraw due to a lack of supplies. However, what would end up happening was nothing short of stunning. When Leo arrived in the east to confront Saif, he found himself greatly outnumbered just as before, and he decided to go for the hat trick and repeat his tactic of setting up in a mountain pass and trying to ambush Saif on the way back. Now, Saif had experienced the worst defeat of his career just 10 years before at the hands of this same general using this same tactic. So you would think that he would have been very wary of what Leo was up to and would have been trying to figure out exactly where Leo was at all times. For whatever reason, he was not able to do that. And despite warning from his Tarsiate allies not to use the pass at Andrasis, Saif decided that that was his best option, so he decided to return home by that exact route. Unfortunately for Saif, this was the spot that Leo had chosen for his ambush. And in the ensuing battle on November 8th, 960, Leo succeeded in crushing almost all of Saif's army in a single battle. This was an ambush on the scale of something like a Lake Trasimene in terms of the lopsided casualty figures and the kind of great blow it dealt to Saif's war efforts. Saif's army would never fully recover and he himself was barely able to escape. Not only was this battle something that broke his army and its ability to mount effective offensives, but it also really undermined the faith that many of his subordinates had in him and some of his subordinate leaders would actually revolt. So Saif's power would never recover from this. And when we look at the successes that Nicephorus would have upon his return, a lot of that was predicated on Leo breaking the back of Saif's realm in the Battle of Andrasis Pass. When Nicephorus returned victorious from Crete, he was given a hero's welcome. He celebrated the triumph in Constantinople and then he returned all of the various field units to their original stations. When he arrived in the east, Nicephorus naturally resumed command, and now he faced a highly favorable situation. He was universally regarded in the empire as a hero now, and his forces were fresh off of a great triumph. Not only that, but his younger brother had just successfully broken the spine of his greatest competitor, and now Nicephorus held the initiative and a massive advantage in terms of manpower and troop quality. His goal, once again, as it had been before going to Crete, was to reduce Cilicia and annex it in the name of the empire. Leo was at his side, having been replaced by Marianos Arguros in the west for whatever reason, and now the two brothers could get back to beating up on Saif al-Dalla and the various powers in Cilicia, the things that up to this point they had done best. Things in Cilicia had been going well under the direction of the two brothers and their nephew, and most likely had they been allowed to proceed with their 963 plans, Nicephorus and his subordinates would have succeeded in conquering Cilicia for good that year. However, that was not to be because the Emperor Romanus II, a young man of about 25 years old, suddenly died after a hunting expedition and left a power vacuum. He had two young sons, but neither of them were anywhere near being ready to rule. At the time, Basil II was about five and Constantine VIII was maybe three. So clearly they would need a strong guardian for a number of years. Nicephorus was a candidate on the one hand, and he would find himself arrayed against the well-placed Marianos Arguros and eunuch Joseph Bringas, the chief administrator of the empire, on the other side. Now, this conflict would devolve into a short-lived civil war, 
and part of Bringas's plan was to capture and imprison some of Nicephorus's relatives. Leo happened to be in the capital, presumably trying to do some diplomatic work on behalf of his brother when Bringas sent men to capture him. Despite having to leave his father in the Hagia Sophia to take refuge, Leo was able to escape Constantinople by dressing up as a city workman and then escaping by night on a small boat to the other side of the Bosporus where he reunited with his brother. Things in the city broke down, there was a riot, Arguros was killed, and then Nicephorus was able to enter the city and claim the throne unopposed. When Nicephorus took the throne in August, Leo was appointed as Logothete, the chief financial officer of the empire, and he was also given the high title Coropalates. Of course, Bardos, their father, would be honored with the title of Caesar. Despite his role as a Logothete and as his brother's right-hand man in Constantinople, Leo would remain militarily active, and he would still be able to accomplish a few more things on the battlefield. One thing that's worth noting about Nicephorus and Leo is that Nicephorus II Phocas was famously childless. His wife, and I think he had a child or maybe she was pregnant, had died when he was younger. He had never remarried, and he lived a pretty ascetic lifestyle, so he had no interest in remarrying or siring children or anything of that nature. So now that he was in a position of great power, presumably he would need an heir from his own family. Now, in theory, he was acting as a placeholder and guardian for the boys Basil II and Constantine VIII, but if the example of Romanus I is any indication, that was hardly ever more than a sham, and most likely Nicephorus dreamed of putting his own family on the throne in some way. And this would mean that the empire would ultimately go to one of Leo's sons. Leo had two known adult sons who were active in the 960s, one was named Nicephorus and the other was named Bardas. In 963, we also hear about Nicephorus having an illegitimate nephew named Manuel. He would die in Italy as a cavalry commander. And it's possible that he was also a son of Leo, albeit one conceived outside of marriage. But it's also possible that Nicephorus had a brother or sister that we no longer know about. But Again, I guess it's most probable that this would be a bastard son of Leo. In 965, having consolidated power in Constantinople sufficiently, Nicephorus and his brother returned to the field, and they now set their sights on finally conquering Cilicia. This had been something that the Focates had been attempting to do in one form or another since 945. So this was effectively the 20th anniversary of Bardas's appointment to the east. Nicephorus launched a grand offensive, and Leo would play perhaps the biggest part in this offensive, despite the fact that Zemiskis had been there the whole time and had the established army in the area. Leo was sent to the city of Tarsus, the largest and most powerful of the Cilician Muslim cities, whereas Nicephorus and Zemiskis would both operate in the area of Mopsuestia. Nicephorus would then reinforce Leo at Tarsus after the fall of Mopsuestia, and the city would end up surrendering due to a lack of supplies on August 16th of 965, the two-year anniversary of Nicephorus's ascension to the throne and entry into Constantinople as emperor. The surrender of Tarsus, interestingly enough, occurred a mere three days before an Egyptian supply fleet arrived to help the beleaguered city. So, had Nicephorus not arrived at the time he did to make things look even more hopeless, or if the Tarsians had been slightly better supplied and willing to hold out for just a couple more days, this campaign could have dragged on quite a bit longer, but as it is, it was a very smooth operation, and it was a case where concentrated and overwhelming force was able to finish off a weakened enemy. Leo's military career seems to have effectively ended in 965, although he may very well have served at other times, we just don't have any evidence. We do know, however, that he was very active in diplomacy as well as his administrative duties. In 968, 
the diplomat and bishop Lutprand of Cremona arrived to negotiate on behalf of his ruler, the future emperor Otto II. Otto's ambition was to marry Romanus II's daughter and thereby solidify his claim to the imperial dignity of the West. However, in typical Byzantine fashion, the brothers Phocas and Byzantine society as a whole tended to look down upon the ambitions of foreigners to marry Byzantine princesses and to claim a title equal to that of the Byzantine emperor. So most of Leo's arrogance toward Lutprand can be interpreted in that light, and it doesn't necessarily reflect upon his character so much as the way that Byzantines always treated such request. Lutprand met with Leo, and he took quite a bit of offense when Leo referred to Otto as Rex rather than as Basileus. Rex, of course, is Latin for king, whereas Basileus, while it is Greek for king, also became the shorthand for emperor. Later on, when Lutprand decided to give up on that point and just say the terms meant the same thing, clearly they all respected each other, they recognized each other's power, uh, Leo got pissed off with that idea that a Rex and a Basileus, i.e. a foreigner and a Byzantine emperor, were on the same level, and he said that Lutprand was just trying to stir up trouble that effectively ended a lot of their interaction. And when Lutprand handed Leo the um, letter of introduction from Otto, rather than taking it by hand to show some friendliness and allow himself to touch this foreign visitor, instead Leo gave offense to Lutprand by sending an intermediary to fetch the letter and then bring it to him so that there was no direct contact between the two men. Now, how standard that was at the Byzantine court is hard to say, but perhaps this was something that was normally only done with the emperor himself. At any rate, we can imagine that since Leo played such a big role in getting Nicephorus to where he was, and since he helped run the government in such an obviously active way, maybe he thought he kind of was the emperor just without a crown. Lutprand gave a succinct summary of Leo's character as he saw it at least. Though he may appear humble, he is in fact a man of considerable stature. If anyone were to lean upon him for support, he would pierce his hand. In other words, Leo was a hard man and an asshole. The story of Nicephorus's reign is one of domestic failure. Largely, domestic success in Byzantine politics meant retaining the goodwill of the people of the city to prevent rioting and to make sure that if there is any kind of conflict, the people will rally to your cause and the guards in Constantinople will remain loyal. However, it seems that for whatever reason, neither Nicephorus nor Leo understood this, despite being highly experienced statesmen by the time that they assumed power. From 963 until 969, what we see is a continual erosion of the popularity of Nicephorus II and by extension of his brother, who was largely running the show. Rumors of corruption abounded, and any time there was a shortage or something went wrong, the assumption is that Nicephorus and his brother were bilking them in order to fund more wars. Nicephorus's only real interest was in funding more campaigns that could then give him more prestige. Skylitzes claims that Nicephorus authorized selling grain stores at inflated prices during the shortages of 968. Leo supposedly partook in this profiteering. Whether he partook in that profiteering on Nicephorus's behalf to raise money for war, or whether he was trying to fill his own coffers is unclear. But we can't prove any of this, and a lot of this, of course, comes from the anti-Nicephorus tradition, which tries to always paint him in the worst possible light. So we simply don't know if Leo was taking part in this, if this was happening at all, if Leo was a competent administrator, or if the increase in prices was simply due to a bad harvest. At any rate, it would appear that neither Leo nor Nicephorus was very good at messaging or keeping the public on their side. I have to conclude with the simple observation that in the instance of the grain shortage of 968, the truth is difficult to establish, and we should not jump to any conclusions one way or the other.
while it is difficult to speak with any degree of confidence about the culpability of the Focatis and the grain shortage of 968, it is very safe to assume that this massively undermined their popularity even more, and that in 969, fresh off of that shortage, the two brothers were deeply unpopular and they had very little favorability from the populace. John Zemiskis, their nephew, decided to revolt, and his coup was mostly greeted with indifference, if not some support. He murdered Nicephorus in his sleep, having crossed secretly from Asia, and no one really mourned for Nicephorus, despite the fact that he had just conquered Crete less than a decade before. So he went from being the greatest hero in the empire to someone that no one really cared about. A pretty sad fate and a pretty sharp downfall. When John launched his coup, Leo and Nicephorus, his son, rather than responding to it or trying to fight back by rallying the troops, fled to the Hagia Sophia. I've read a couple scholars who think that Leo was caught flat-footed by John's move, but more likely it's simply that he realized that no one cared, news was spreading like wildfire through the city, and people were just kind of indifferent to Nicephorus' fate. So Leo knew that trying to rally troops in his own name would probably not work. It's a further piece of evidence that the Phocas name had really been tarnished that John didn't bother to kill Leo or any of his sons when he came to power, but rather contented himself with exiling Leo and his son Nicephorus to exile on Lesbos with no blinding or anything of that nature. It also appears possible that he didn't even force them to take monastic vows. One year into his exile, Leo heard that there was a plot in Asia Minor, specifically in the theme of Armeniakon, to free his son Bardas from prison and put a crown on his head so he could challenge John. When he received that news, Leo and his son Nicephorus decided to try to escape from Lesbos, but they were captured. John, who quickly took control of the situation, initially sentenced his uncle to be blinded, but then rescinded the order for whatever reason. It appears that Leo then stayed quiet for the next 11 years. Just like his father Bardos, Leo had longevity and presumably had quite a bit of energy for a man his age. In 981, Leo reemerges in history because he happened to come up as a topic of discussion when Basil II was negotiating with Ibn Sharam. One of Ibn Sharam's um, requirements from Basil as a concession is that Leo had to be blinded. Presumably Ibn Sharam had in some way suffered from something that, Basil, uh, that Leo had done in the past and wanted to have some revenge. For Basil's part, he was always happy to oblige any request which involved blinding, so he had Leo blinded and got his treaty. While his brother Nicephorus and his nephew John Zemiskis achieved more fame and overall historical recognition due to holding the throne, I would argue that the record event suggests very clearly that Leo was the most talented of the Focatis and possibly also the most talented commander of his entire generation, that being the time period between John Kirkawas and Basil II. The reason why I think Leo was clearly more talented than, say, Nicephorus is if we look at Nicephorus's primary achievement, the conquest of Crete, this was something that he achieved with overwhelming force against a much weaker foe. Sure, the conquest of Crete outweighs in its significance and its ramifications all of Leo's accomplishments combined, but it really wasn't that great of a deed of generalship. When we look at Leo's victories, they were almost always against superior forces. He also defeated Saif on at least three different occasions and did so in clear and overwhelming fashion. It was Leo, after all, who broke the spine of Saif. So Leo does have a claim to historical significance, even if his claim does not include a crown. Had Nicephorus II and Leo done a better job at keeping the people of Constantinople happy, it is possible that a Phocas dynasty could have displaced the Macedonian dynasty and that Leo's sons and grandsons could have then gone on to control Byzantine affairs for several decades. 
As it stands, however, that was not to be the case. And to circle back to the idea of Leo as the most talented of the Focades, if we assume that the 7th century Phocas was a member of the same family, I think it's very safe to say that Leo Phocas the Younger had him beat by just a little bit.